Good morning, everyone. I am not entirely sure what's going to happen today, except I think that it will undoubtedly be wonderful. Uh, as you know, we're probably around 10 or 10.30 or something like that. We'll have uh, a visitor or more than one from these very exciting events that are going on in Costa Rica. And I won't say much about it until that time, because uh, uh, they can give the background and everything better than I can. And what I'm going to try to do, left to my own devices, is wrap up the story of uh, the Larzac campaign and then go on to consider some of the other anti-militarism campaigns that took place elsewhere in Europe, especially looking at uh, a couple of chapters in uh, nonviolent social movements. So that, that's my plan. Uh, if you have other plans, let me know. But let's get back to our story. We were approximately – oh, uh, I actually have a couple of announcements also. There's – tonight at 7 p.m., there's a concert benefiting Neve Shalom Wahat Al Salam, which is at biracial uh, high school in – um, we're the longest, the oldest of its type. This is an interesting kind of nonviolence institution that we haven't, I think, touched on yet. But communities where you try to bring together, uh, especially young people from rival communities, see if they can resolve their conflicts. We even do that here at Berkeley. We have a course in peace and conflict studies where, for example, we bring Indian and Pakistani students in. Could do this with Armenians and Turks. Who knows? and use the neutral turf of the university as a place where they can resolve their conflict with one another and then go back home and use those techniques on the ground, so to speak. So that, that's the idea. And there was a uh, Kamaldili's priest, I think, named Bruno Hussar, who in the 50s decided that he had to leave France and go to Palestine and set up the school where they would have exactly half Israeli and Palestinian kids. And now there's about eight or ten experiments like that that are going on in the Holy Land. They are – I think they would our, – our sense is now that they are a very good step, but they are not enough because you get these children together. They have a wonderful time. They, they form these friendships very easily. And then you send them back out into the apartheid situation that they came from and it doesn't hold up. And there's a very heart-rending documentary film called Promises, which is based on that. But in itself, the experiment is uh, terrific. And the earliest one, probably the most successful, is Neve Shalom slash Wahat Al Salam, which means Oasis of Peace. And there's a musical event taking place here in Berkeley, benefiting that tonight. And then I want to remind you that next Wednesday we're having the two speakers from uh, Belin, which is probably the active hotspot for direct nonviolent resistance against uh, Israeli plans. Uh, and we're going to have a special reception for them that evening for us. Okay? And then there's a talk called Sacred Hospitality Between Religions. I'll just put this out here. Because it's – Harry, I think this is kind of a pretty graphic. Enjoy and possibly even go to the talk. <coughs> okay, so we're going to get back to <coughs> Larzac. And I'm, I've chosen it because – well, because I met Shanti Das, so <coughs> it gives me a kind of personal connection. But also because it is an unusual example of a sustained campaign that uh, succeeded and was – seminal for a whole movement that uh, swept through Europe and particularly Germany in the decade after, the anti-nuclear movement, which took on a slightly different character because uh, the people of Larzac were opposed to French nuclearization. But it, the, a new element was added later on in Europe when the Americans wanted to base their missiles on Europe because, you know, it's the old idea, let's you and him fight. 
and it's slightly easier to destroy Russia from European soil than from American soil for technical reasons. Uh, starting with the Dutch and rapidly and vehemently joined by the Germans, there was a feeling that we don't want these things on our soil and it was a typically mixed motive thing. It was partly anti-violence and we just don't want these weapons. We don't want to help you be so violent, a certain degree of that. But certainly also there's a feeling among Germans in particular that, hey, you know, it's 1985 now. World War II is over now and we're not just here for you to kick around. And I, I remember one German journalist talking about being at the UN and having the East German minister get up speaking in fluent Russian and then the West German minister get up speaking in fluent English and they're, they're losing their whole culture and they just didn't want to be a patsy for the Americans. I mean, are we blaming them? No. But we're, but we're saying that in itself this was a, a different from saying that I'm opposed to violence. I don't think it works. Anyway, it got very big and it did prevent the deployment of some missiles and um, all of that came from Larzac. Other things came from Larzac also and in, in other ways too. It kind of helps because it seems to represent every major issue that we think is important in the development of nonviolence since Gandhi and King. And we did a very good job last time uh, talking, spotting these things as they came along. So let's just continue. Um, I was down to November of 1978 and uh, two things happen almost simultaneously. There is a foot march to Paris. Constantly you're going, going up to Paris from the Larzac Plateau in the Dordogne. And that was a march of 710 kilometers, which is you know, not a joke. It's a little bit longer than Gandhi's march to the sea. And people knew how to do that by then. And at the same time, there was a judicial order issued that people had to vacate the land that they had designated to take over for the expansion of the military base. So there's an expansion, uh, ex an escalation, I guess is the word I'm looking for, escalation on both sides. In response to this, uh, 13 men and women get together in the Cathedral of Rodé. I should be putting some of these words on the board, I guess. I think it's feminine. Amy, is it La Dordogne or Le Dordogne? Yeah. La? Okay. Uh, anyway, Le Dordogne. <laughs> and uh, that's the region that we're talking about. And of course, the, the the, that's the department. And the commune is La Rosac. And one of the capital cities in the area is Rodé. And it has a cathedral there. And so 13 men and women gather to go – to do a fast in the cathedral. Uh, at this point, fasting and demonstrations spread rapidly. And that's one of the things that you really want to happen, but it's so very difficult to predict and control. And it spread into 100 departments. We have people doing sympathy, fast, and demonstrations and so forth. So. Uh, by the way, Alex and Amy have just done some wonderful contributions to the Meta website. So I want to uh, reinforce that as a useful resource for us. But what makes the connection in my mind now is this question of the fast. We discussed it a lot last semester. It's considered the most powerful technique in the arsenal, if you want to call it that of nonviolent – the nonviolence repertoire. Uh, the most powerful thing that you can do is lay down your life. And one way to do that with enough time that the opponent can respond is by fasting. You know, it's not like dousing yourself with gasoline and by the time they know about it, it's all over and you just made this <coughs> statement, whatever kind of statement that is. And that's something we can also discuss. But for fasting, it was a technique that Gandhi used Often, probably about 12 or 13 really major fasts that he went on. And in the course of his career, he developed a regular set of guidelines for doing it. 
And so the question before us is, did these people do the right thing? Was it the right guidelines? So did they follow the rules of the game? And again, we're trying not to be judgmental. We're trying to be analytical because A, who are we to sit on judgment on people who are, you know, of losing their livelihoods and risking their lives to protect it. We're not sitting in judgment on any way. Anyway, our judgment on judgment is that it's not acceptable. But we want to be analytical. The other reason that we want to be analytical rather than judgmental is when you're writing your papers, this will be a very important modality to keep in mind. Okay, so Catherine, you want to start us off? Okay, that's a very good question too. Are we talking about the 13 original fasters there in Rode, which is sort of the, the spiritual capital of the movement at this point and where it intersects with the public? Or the other people who joined them? I guess we're talking about the whole enchilada. Michael? Um, I don't think it was a fast unto death, but it probably was it, it also certainly was not a time limited fast. They weren't saying we're going to fast for 10 days. I think they were probably saying we're going to fast until you rescind that order. With not specified, you know, dot, 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 what, where it'll lead to. And in one case, there was a person uh, recently, I think it's in Oaxaca, where there's been some very, very interesting uprisings and I haven't dragged them in here yet because they're not entirely nonviolent and I don't know a whole lot about them actually, but it's an extremely interesting thing going on in that city and there's a guy there that fasted for 71 days. So uh, that's a lot, of <laughs> not a lot of beans and tortillas to go without. So uh, John? Interesting issue John is raising here. Uh, again, it's one that I hadn't considered, but I'm not proud. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, in it inherently for fasting to work well, it should not depend on numbers. Um, there are times when groups have to do it, like Guantanamo, like Long Cash Prison, which we talked about last semester in the Irish. Uh, uprising and we, we mostly decided that that was not according to the rules of the game. But uh, inherently it's a, a human being has to make this decision for him or herself. I mean, the one thing you absolutely cannot do is coerce other people into fasting, right? This <laughs> that would be completely backfire. Uh, so it's a deeply personal commitment that has to be made. And that leads us to the first criterion, I suppose, which in the famous list of five, uh, the one I'm putting first right now is that you have to be the right person to do it. And that, in a, that means two things. It has a strategic interpretation and it has a principled interpretation. I'll give you the strategic one because you know, it's sort of a throwaway anyway. And then we'll talk about the deeper meaning of, you know, risking your life uh, and doing it in a way that works. And it, okay, just let me bracket that for a second. When I say that it works, it means that it's persuasive and it awakens the conscience of the opponent, okay? If it doesn't work, it means one of two things. The opponent doesn't budge. Or the opponent budges, gives you what he or she wants, but with a f resentment. So, okay? So that's coercive. So in order for it to work, the person doing it has to be the right person. And that means two things. It has to be a person who has some um, visibility, some clout. You know, you hear that some Joe Blow is fasting somewhere and, and you know, you might say, oh, well, that's too bad. Uh, or now this is somewhat tongue in cheek, but you may remember that final, very very dramatic scene from the Attenborough movie where Gandhi is fasting and Sardar Patel comes in and uh, Patel is a little bit overweight and Gandhi says to him kind of facetiously, "You should join me in this fast <laughs> and do you some good." And Patel says, "When I fast, they let me die. <laughs> when you fast, they stop rioting." 
Arby? Uh, anyway, the issue is very clear and is, is the strategic issue. The strategic issue is do you stand a chance of reaching your opponent? And you have to be a person th that has some authority and some status in order to do this. Uh, but Arby is raising another very interesting point. If you don't have respect, if you don't have status, if you are not considered fully human by your opponent, that doesn't mean that nonviolence is ruled out. I mean, you can gain these things by being nonviolent. My favorite example of that is when Jimmy Carter became president. The first thing he did was he brought Rosa Parks up from the South to be fated in the White House. And he said, if it weren't for you, I would not be president because you brought dignity to the South. I mean, being a northerner, I didn't even, didn't even realize they lacked dignity. But they felt that very keenly. And by having been the venue of a dis conspicuous, nonviolent, courageous movement, it raised the prestige of the southern region throughout the United States and that of the United States throughout the world for that reason. We've reversed all of that now. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. But now, does anyone rec remember me talking about the really the deeper – Especially if we are talking about a serious fast where you're risking your life or willing to lay it down, what being the right person really means. This was one comment I had to add to your essay, Alex, so I'm not sure you saw this. Or not. I hope you don't mind. Does anyone want to venture a thought about that? Let me – while you're thinking, let me share with you a story. And uh, if I've already told you this, I apologize in advance, but that's how it goes. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did tell you about it actually not long ago. A friend of mine was uh, in Vietnam. He was polluted by Agent Orange and contracted a brain tumor and was being kept alive on life support, his wife and his daughter visiting him every day. And at one point he says, okay, this is enough. I don't want this anymore. Unplug me. So they unplugged him from his life support. And guess what? About five, six hours later he comes roaring back and saying, plug me back in. So what am I getting at here? John? It has a lot to do with the fact that Gandhi heard, had a little voice from God telling him to do this. But suppose uh, – Suppose you don't believe in God, God forbid, or you don't believe in God as an external speaker. How could we interpret this, Joanna? Yes, that's what I was getting at. Did you want to add something? Yeah. You're, yeah, you, you're strong enough to overcome or have some actual control over your will to live, which is a very difficult thing to reach. You know, uh, you have lots of people – well, here's another story just to drive the point home. That's what teachers do. They drive home points. Uh, there was a British retired military person who was living in an, a spiritual community in South India where one of the greatest sages of modern times was uh, the, the saint there, Ramana Maharshi. And this man, Colonel Osborne, was um, riding on his bicycle on the top of Arunachala, which is a pretty high little mountain for Tamil Nadu. And he started back for the ashram, so he's heading his bike down the hill. And as he's shooting downhill on his bicycle in a very good mood, he felt sort of blissed out. And I mean, after all, you're living with the greatest saint in India. It's a lot of things to feel good about. There's a sweet little daughter and all the rest of it. And up comes the two o'clock bus, trudging, trudging up the hill about, I don't know, 30 or so miles an hour maybe. And Osborne – so the idea dawned on him. Hey, I'm in such a good mood. All I have to do is on the handlebars, I could end it here. 
I don't have to be unhappy ever again. Uh, but he didn't for some funny reason that he was not in touch with at that moment. And he got back to the ashram and he, he asked the, the, the guru if he did the right thing. And he said, you certainly did the right thing not to kill yourself because on the surface of your mind you were blissed out. But as soon as the body started to really be pulled away, you would have panicked. And uh, you would have been really desperately sorry that you had made that stupid move. So I'm emphasizing the seriousness of being able to voluntarily put your life on the line at such a deep level that it's a meaningful choice and you are not at some point in the process going to say, I, I give up, bring me some granola, <laughs> this is all over. Um, so that's the first criterion. Um, let's just run through all five of them and then we'll see how we feel about these fasters, though to be sure we don't know a heck of a lot about them. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, very possibly. The second criterion is similar to the first and that is not only do you have to be the right person to do the fast, the, per the reference public uh, against whom the fast is directed has to be well chosen also. And t using Gandhi's famous term, you can only fast against a lover. That means somebody who cares whether you live or die so that they're going to be reached by this. And while we're at it, it's perfectly possible that that criterion wasn't met here because it's hard to gauge the attitude of the government and the military at this point. Okay, number three, Joanna. Oh, you have something else to say? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that, okay. Well, who, I mean, this could be number three or number five. It doesn't really matter. Remember, I'm a humanities person. I can't handle numbers larger than four anyway. But it has to be the last resort um, because it is uh, so liable to misinterpretation <laughs> because it can exert a lot of power on the opponent and in all things concerning nonviolence, you never want to go faster and harder than you have to. You always want to give the opponent the maximum choice to get it. You wake up and say, oh, I, I, now I understand. And that way you've got a real persuasion and that's permanent. And in fact, if I had a little checklist of three or four things that I would tell the peace movement, which I do actually, of my website, <laughs> one of the things I would constantly tell them is the timing. Don't go faster than you need to because then you're implying that the opponent will not listen instead of giving them the maximum opportunity to listen. Okay. So it has to be the last resort and we'll go back systematically and consider whether we think it was or not. Fourth criterion for now. Uh, oh, okay. Hold on a second, Catherine. Did you? It has to be a doable demand, yeah. I mean, it has to be realistic. I always talk about these two people who fasted in Washington, D.C. to get Gorbachev and Eisenhower to stop the arms race. You know, that's just not realistic. You've got millions and millions of people, billions and billions of dollars are all this very intense momentum to do this thing. You can't just expect them to snap out of it. And okay, we've got one more. Going very well, yeah. Yes, it has to be consistent with the movement. So you think of those Irish uh, hunger strikers in Long Kesh. Here they were out, you know, dynamiting probably Catholic churches and uh, kneecapping people, <laughs> all of this rather not nonviolent stuff. And then when they had no other recourse, suddenly they're going on a hunger strike. Well, you just can't expect that to be very impressive. Okay. Well, let's start with the last mentioned criterion. Uh, does it look to you like this was consistent with the rest of the movement? I'm seeing nods of approval. I guess the, the camera is not picking them up, but yes, they're all nodding in approval. Uh, I think this is a no, this is a no brainer. This one is because this is one of the most uncontaminated, in accordance with Nagler's law, uncontaminated nonviolent campaigns that we're ever going to be considering this whole semester. There, as far as I can remember, uh, having read a 
fair number of accounts of the Larzac campaign in the whole nine and a half years. I'm not aware of even a single episode of violence by any definition except maybe, of course, what goes on in the heart. I mean, we're not saying that people didn't have any resentment or stuff like that. But in terms of behavior, there are no Molotov cocktails we need to worry about as we did with the uh, Intifada. There is no ambiguous stone throwing where we have to decide whether this is defiance or an attempt to harm. None of that went on. Thanks to our hero, our leader, uh, Lonzo Del Vasto. Okay, so that criterion, I think we're really in good shape. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Do you think it was the right people? It's sort of a trick question in a way because how the hell would we know? I mean, <laughs> we'd really have to know those people and know something about them. I. I mean, this whole theory that nonviolence is possible at a deep but sustained level is predicated on the fact that ordinary people are capable of rising to incredible heights. And we know that when challenged, people can do that. Again, my iconic anecdote in this regard is the woman in San Francisco, her, her son, her little young four or five year old son is playing outside. She suddenly, she hears a Huge noise outside. She runs out. A car has tipped over. Her son is pinned under the car. And everybody is running around panicking. They didn't have 9-11 yet. Uh, what are we going to do? Get a crowbar? Call a tow truck? All these big strong men are running around like chickens without their heads wondering what to do. The mother ran over to the car and grabs hold of the bumper and picks the damn thing up by one end so the men can get her son out from under it then lets the car drop and probably collapsed at that point. But if you had asked that woman, can you pick up a Ford Falcon, <laughs> she would say, no, you know, are you crazy? I, I can't even pick up a De Chavot Citroen or a, or a little Fiat or, or maybe a skateboard, but <laughs> that's about it. But you know, when put to it, as Shakespeare says, we can do incredible things. So I think we'll just have to leave that one a question mark. It may have been among them people who by that time were so committed that they felt that this was a question of do or die and they could carry that down to a deep level in their consciousness and they may have been right. It gets more dubious as the circle spreads out to the wider and wider people. Okay, that's two criteria. We've already heard from Joanna that she doesn't think that the regime was a lover. Wasn't that you who said that? No, okay. We're all one anyway. <laughs> We're all going to get one big grade at the end of the semester <laughs> as I decide what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, probably not 100% okay on the lover criterion either. How about um, timing, last resort? From what we know of the situation, Michael? Pretty good, I would say. Um, uh, given the fact that the judiciary had just ordered people off the land uh, and that was in response to a big demonstration. So what does that tell us in terms of the famous escalation curve anyway? Remember intensity of conflict versus time. We have this famous curve and I, I mean <laughs> famous to me. <laughs> uh, and we divide it into stages and this this stage is characterized by what? Everybody remember? This everybody should have seen because it's on page 108 of my book. <laughs> Alex? It's when the appeals, to reason appeals to reason still work. So you do conflict resolution here. Uh, that's a C for conflict resolution. <laughs> um, and they had just had a how many kilometers? 710 kilometer march with thousands of people. And this was not the first time they had done that. And the regime responds by saying, okay, we'll make it worse. So obviously we're not in the zone anymore. We have to be doing satyagraha. The question is, which is going to mean in this case civil disobedience, the question is are we here yet, which means you have to be willing to risk your life. Um, and that is, uh, I think I would agree, 
Michael, it was probably was pretty good, but not. It's not a hundred percent certain. I think if people were very, very clever and had really good leadership, I bet they could have figured out other things that they might have done, and reserved the fast till really, really last m minute. Yeah, Catherine. That's very interesting. How to compare this dynamic, how to correlate this dynamic that we're talking about here and the timing of everything with the paradox of repression dynamic. That's an interesting question. I guess what you're suggesting is that you want to do something like that in such a sitting setting that it will evoke the paradox of repression and not that they will ignore you. That would be an interesting test. If you had done the timing right, they would try to crack down or back down. It's a win-win situation for you and for the opponent eventually. I think we've done four out of five, or have we done all five? I think we've done all five. Yeah. No. Doable. Is the demand doable? D obviously. Yeah. That's all they're asking them to do is rescind a silly order that they just put in. So, yeah. Now. I guess, you know, if we wanted to really give them a weighted average or something, we would say they got 3.5 out of 5 rules. And by modern criteria, I think that's pretty darn good. Um, <laughs> by and large, I think most fasts are ill-advised that have happened since Gandhi and King, but occasionally not. But for certain, it is that if people really knew how the dynamic worked and how to use it, they could make it much more effective. So, okay, very good. That's, this is very helpful. Uh, the farmers at this point sent a delegation on to Paris to speak to the president of the republic, le président de la république, Gaspard Destang who refused to receive them. But when they arrived in Paris, 50,000 people turned out to greet them. So this was a kind of a high point of the solidarity and support from the general population. Meanwhile, they did, uh, given that the obstructive program was at an impasse, they did exactly the right thing, which was to go and do more CP. And they started building hospitals but where did they build them? Can you guess? Andrea? On their land. They built it on land that was condemned. So you have a perfect blend, uh, uh, synergism of constructive and obstructive work. Because now look, if they want to come in and clear you off the land, they have to wreck a hospital to do that. That's not going to make them look too, too good. So that was a very smart move. I think it would give them a five out of five on that one. And at that point, they began long negotiations with the Minister of Defense. So maybe we could, talking about that fast again, maybe what we should say is this. Uh, in so far as the fast helped put them in a better bargaining position with the Minister of Defense, the timing was perfect. If the fast was intended to solve the question by itself, it was premature because they had some bargaining yet to do. And sometimes, you know, we err in assuming that the opponent will not physically sit down and listen to us, and this is a very big mistake. I remember during the Free Cuba days, uh, the, the Free Cuba Committee, this is the bound up with some terribly dark stories in the history of this country. I don't want to go into the whole thing, but there was this group that was planning to assassinate the President of the United States, for the not because they had anything particular against him, but so that they could have their day in court and th the Fair Play for Cuba Committee could address the public because the media were ignoring them. And uh, needless to say, I am not in favor of this technique. It doesn't come under any allowable exception for nonviolence. But more to the point, uh, one of the people who was part of this plot to go and kill the president so that he could talk to his congressman said, hmm, maybe I could just go and talk to my congressman. So he went and said, I'd like to talk to the congressman. He said, sure, come in. So, <laughs> so 
that was a much, much cheaper way of getting there. So, okay, we're in negotiations, and that's very good. Uh, but at the same time, uh, a thousand farmers decide to hand in their military papers, the famous papier militaire, which was sung about in many French ballads. And th th here's a very clever move I want you to comment on. They decided to hand them to the UN. And they did. Interessant, n'est-ce pas? Okay. So what are we talking about here? Given that there's no European Union yet, Maastricht is just a small city in the south of Holland where people go to college. <laughs> uh, what is the significance of this move in various levels? This is going to lead, I think, to a very interesting discussion, but only if it leads to some discussion. <laughs> yes, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, it expands the circle, involves a third party, and what a third party. You know, they didn't – okay, Peace Brigades International doesn't exist yet either. That's with just a few years down the road. But it's not like they handed them in to the French Office of the Red Cross or like the War Resisters League. What they did – well, why am I making such a fuss about the fact that it's the UN? What's going on here? Not being Europeans, it may be a little hard for us to grasp this. See, what I'm getting at here is that they didn't just go beyond the two parties to a third party, which they certainly did. They went above the nation state. You know, the argument on the part of the government is this is uh, – I must I almost said droit de seigneur. It's certainly not that. But this is eminent domain. This is about the fact that the national government trumps individual needs. And they're saying the national government is not the highest law in the planet either. And so this is a, a tremendous uh, enlargement of the frame. So it was an extremely clever move that I think probably – Lanza del Vasto did. And it gets us to another question within the whole movement. Maybe I'll put that off a little bit until we hit it again. Um, and incidentally, they f there wasn't uh, – it, it, here's another neat thing. That wasn't their first idea. They wanted to hand it in to the defense minister, and he refused to accept them. So they said, okay, we'll give them to the UN. So this is – Example number 942 of an oppressive regime doing something to make things worse for the, for the resistor only to find that it backfires. You know, I guess maybe our very first example we ever considered in this whole sequence was when in 1909 Gandhi wrote Hind Swaraj in Gujarati and the British Raj refused to allow it to be published. So they said, okay, I'll publish it in English where it was read by millions of more people and now it's still a world classic to this day. Um, and if you're doing your thing right and you're doing uh, – you, you're bringing in the law of progression, everything is building nicely for you, a lot of these things will probably happen. Okay. Yeah, Arby? Do you think that the of the UN would be that maybe the the Okay, Arby's question is, did, do I think that the handing of the documents up to the UN was because the farmers felt that the thing could not be solved within the country? I, I don't think so because it was perfectly possible for the government to just back down and say, okay, this isn't such a great idea. Mind you, governments don't like – to do that. You know, they lose face, whatever that is. Um, but you remember one of the earliest, earliest in history example probably that we considered ever was the uh, attempt to put a statue of Caligula in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in around 36, I think. And uh, 
there's this huge uprising and the local uh, uh, guard of the, of the Syrian uh, army who's in charge of the area, he sends a, a letter to Caligula saying maybe we should back down. This isn't such a good idea right now. Caligula immediately ordered him to commit suicide, thus getting himself assassinated. And our story ends relatively happily, except it would be much nicer if Caligula had a vision of Jesus in the middle of the night and got converted and said, I'm doing the wrong thing. Anyway, I'm sorry. Back to our subject. Um, no, I don't think – ah, cringe on her. Just let me answer one question. I don't think that was the issue. And this will uh, – no, you can come in. <laughs> but just let me finish my sentence. You know how I am. Hello, Maria. Bienvenida. Uh, I think the issue was not that they felt that the government could not solve the problem for them, but that they felt the, pr the issue was much bigger than the French government and the French farms. And that's what we're going to talk about next time. But now please join me in welcoming our heroines. Please come up. <laughs> Thank you. Bienvenida. Welcome for nada. You said it, Maria? Sandra. Sandra. Miguel Nagla. A vos se presentó mis alumnos. Pueden hablar en inglés? Okay. I do my best. No, no, you don't have to. I feel more comfortable in Spanish. Mauricio? Si. So please. Yes, why don't. First, I'd like to. I love hearing that stuff again. <laughs> uh, this, I think many of you know Jennifer Kuiper, who is the executive director of Meta, and it's she who has arranged this wonderful meeting for us. Eh, no sé qué quieren que les diga. <risa> no, es eh, efectivamente un inmerecido, eh, no sé, es inmerecido el estar aquí. Estamos muy conmovidas porque no, no imaginamos que nos iban a invitar a una clase en esta universidad tan prestigiosa. Así es que... Estamos acá para contarles acerca de nuestro humilde trabajo. Y dispuestas a contestar las preguntas que ustedes nos hagan. situación en qué sentido o sea uh, yo represento estoy oficialmente representando al gobierno de costa rica yo soy abogada del ministerio de justicia justicia evidentemente Oficialmente no puedo hablar de algunas cosas que siento. Pero puedo contarles que en este momento hay una discusión en el país eh, por el CAFTA. Um, currently there's a nationwide discussion on CAFTA. Porque somos un país que nos caracterizamos por los extremos. Because we're a country characterized by extremes. Somos muy chiquitos. We're very small. Pero. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ricos y ricas. <laughs> <laughs> Rich. <laughs> pero. Uh, muy vehementes cuando decimos algo. Ponemos mucha vehemencia. 
Entonces, en este momento, las personas que están ocupando los puestos de gobierno the people, um, in the government post quieren que pase el CAFTA, que se apruebe. Um, want to pass CAFTA. Pero el pueblo But the people no está de acuerdo. Don't agree. Se nos ha informado muy recientemente que como es una ley, el CAPTA, que debe ser aprobada en la Asamblea Legislativa. Um, we've been informed that since it's a law, porque tiene que convertirse en ley, ¿verdad? El señor presidente que tenía la iniciativa la ha retirado momentáneamente de la corriente legislativa. Um, so the current president has uh, not passed it. He's retired He's the, the, um, the student from, from the assembly. Okay. Eso no dice... Eh, que no vamos a discutir el tema, pero que eh, posiblemente con la presión eh, que está ejerciendo el pueblo, ha decidido que por este momento uh, mejor se retira el proyecto. So that means that, um, that doesn't mean that they're not going to address the situation, but for right now, what the people want, um, it's better not to address it. Cuando venía en, eh, para acá, me comentaba Jennifer que querían que hablásemos uh, de antes de 1948. Uh, les puedo hacer un hiper resumen. I'm going to give a, I could give a brief account of um, pre-1948, which is what Jennifer had asked to, for us to speak about. Hay algunas cuestiones. Algunas cosas. There's certain things, certain questions. Questions, eh, pregunta, es algunas cosas que sucedieron entonces en el pasado y que es posible vuelvan a, o sea, que se esté dando, es como dice, una sopa, un caldo, un caldo de cultivo parecido, 48 ahora. Es ánimos eh, exacerbados, personas molestas, eh, solo que en el 48 sí privó la violencia y hubo una revolución armada. So, maybe Mauricio, you can help me out. Um, that there's the same sentiments from 1948 as today, there's uh, similarities. Um, but back in 1948, there was violence, there was a revolution, um, armed revolution. Y si hubo personas muertas. In which resulted in deaths. En esta oportunidad, In this opportunity. Eh, muchas personas están interesadas en que no haya violencia. So many people today are very interested in not, um, that they're not to have violence. So that's why they're interested in non-violence, so that the same things won't occur again. Y que se usen todos los principios, eh, diálogo, verdad, amor, tolerancia, to use all the methods of dialogue and tolerance and love para solucionar el conflicto to solve the conflict que tenemos en este momento. That's occurring today. I'm very happy to be here as well. Thank you very much for having me. I don't work with the government. <laughs> But we're very close friends. I 
I think that at this uh, very special moment in time as well, it's, it's a time of revolution. De revolución en la, en la mente y en el corazón. And revolution in one's uh, mind and heart. Las armas son diferentes. The weapons are different. Son el, el corazón y la, y la mente. The heart and the mind. No las armas que usábamos antes. No vamos a matar gente. La gente se puede morir por falta de información y por terrorismo. We, people may die from lack of information, from terrorism. El del muy I'd like to briefly touch on the problem of terrorism. El 7 de septiembre estuve en el World Trade Center el de I, I was there dancing, the last uh, 7th of September. And when this took place, I decided that I wouldn't be part of the echo of terrorism. There was a kind of terrorism which wanted me to be afraid. I decided I didn't want to be I don't want to repeat information to scare people further. I want to put forth my love and my peace to not respond to that shout of terrorism which is designed to scare people. And it's a very subtle way in which we all actually help out in order to Nos further impacta, It impacts us. And when we talk about it with other people, we're in a way being part to the terrorism. Be care, let's be careful of that. In Costa Rica, in this moment, the revolution is in the streets. At this time in Costa Rica, the revolution is in the streets. And at the same time, citizens, though we may work in the government part-time, we're still people and citizens. And we go to the streets and protest uh, with songs, with uh, banners, colorful banners, with poetry. In the city. And in all the outskirts of town, in all parts of the country. The government of the United States has spent a lot of money to promote CAPTA. And we don't have the money to counter that. But we have the power. That's a one revolution. I work with a World Without Armies uh, for a uh, conference in April. The, con the conference is called A Conference for the Abolition of Armies of Women in Central America before antes de an before 2020. And for this, the proposition of a world without armies is to go uh, taking the army from uh, military to civilian. Esa es la consulta que vamos a hacer con las mujeres centroamericanas. 
that is a consultation that which we are trying to do with the women of Central America. We will be speaking about education, peace education, creative resolution of conflicts, and demilitarization. <laughs> Esos son los propósitos. El hecho de ser solo mujeres es muy importante. The, these are our propositions. The fact that we are all women is very important. Al principio, cuando yo fui invitada, at first when I was invited, yo decía, ah, no, a mí me gusta mucho el hombre. I said, ah, oh, <laughs> no, I like men too much. <laughs> yo quiero incluirlos. I want to include them. Pero después entendí, but later I understood, que hay una intimidad y un that there was, that there's an intimacy in something quite special when just women are united. Delicate women. Strong when it comes to defending our sons and our grandchildren. <laughs> And that's a bit of what I've brought to share with you as much as I could stand here and speak all day. Thank you. Is there a role being played by the University of Peace in helping you to strategize, helping you to organize? Not in this moment. I used to be a director of art at the University for Peace two times ago, well, more than 10 years ago. Uh, now we are very close friends. I'm working with Don Rodrigo Carazo. Uh, I, I used to work with him in that time. And her, his, his wife, Doña Estrella, she's the president of our front conference. We work together, but not officially the university because in this conference. Can you, I'm not sure if people here are familiar with CAFTA and the fact that Costa Rica is the last country to sign and what is at risk right now and why the people are protesting. Maybe you can say a little bit about this for background. The problem starts with the name uh, Free Trade Agreement. No es comercio. It's not trade. Eh, nos impone transgénicos. It uh, imposes uh, genetically modified uh, materials. Sí. Nos impone el uso libre de las aguas de, para pescar. Uh, it imposes or has restrictions on the free use of fishing waters. Y para hacer corto el cuento, voy a poner una similitud. And to make the story short, I'll use an analogy. Es, hay un de There's a big problem in interpreting the agreement. Por ejemplo, For example, usted y yo nos her and I get married. And I offer to take her out uh, on a trip once a month. Uh -huh. yo pienso, oh, Europa, Paris. <laughs> and she thinks Europe, Paris. Y él va a a dar una a la and I just <laughs> take her around the block. Es un gran That's a big problem. <laughs> Yo voy a que estoy I'm going to think that I'm married, y él no. and I'm not. <laughs> Algo parecido pasa también. Nosotros tenemos mucho compromiso y eh, Estados Unidos no se Oh, so the problem is, is that Costa Rica has a lot at stake and the United States is not quite as engaged as Costa Rica is. The treaty is 3,000 pages in very small lettering, very fine print, and few people have read it. Uh, 
There's a book on the internet uh, in Spanish, not yet uh, translated perhaps. 101 reasons. to not accept the CAFTA, or TLC, as it's known in Spanish. Henry Mora. By Henry Mora. Uh, with the National University of Costa Rica. That's an incredible uh, resource to find out what's eh, going on. De hecho, los países, el ejemplo que tenemos de México, Chile, que ya firmaron el, el, el tratado, es terrible. In fact, the examples we have of other countries which have signed agreements such as Mexico and Chile is horrible. Además, no es correcto que todos los países centroamericanos y República Dominicana estemos tratados por igual. At the same time, it's also not right that all of the countries in Central America and the Dominican Republic are treated equally. Cada uno tenemos nuestras economías diferentes, nuestra historia diferente. Considering each country has a different history, different economy. Y, y pensamos que nosotros no queremos firmar el tratado. And we think we don't want to sign the free trade agreement. ¿Quieres agregar cosas? Me <laughs> Would you like to add something? <laughs> Better not. So you have uh, discussed two issues here at least. One is CAFTA, and the other is the bigger question of demilitarization. And I think everyone here senses what the connection is. But can you say a little bit about what is the relationship? Si. Did you start just focusing on CAFTA and then go on to include the wider questions of World Without Armies? The point of connection between the two, CAFTA and demilitarization, is that the agreement makes it possible or opens the possibility up for the um, building of weapons in Costa Rica. Or parts for weapons. At the same time, uh, the possibility for a Central American wide army to combat uh, drug traffic, which is not entirely true. Does everybody here know that Costa Rica, since the revolution in 1948, does not have an army? It's one of the very few countries that does not have an army and does not have a security arrangement with any other state. So they're desperately trying to hold on to that. It's like the situation in Japan with Article 9 of their constitution, forbidding them to wage war against the And also Panama is engaged in a similar process as well. Oh, it no longer has an army as well. Nació la Segunda República. The Second Republic um, was created. Y uno de los elementos importantes de esa Segunda República. And one of the most important elements of that Second Republic. 
es una socialización de las ganancias, digamos. Es de, como hay un término... Socialization of benefits. Eh, y por eso tenemos seguro social universal que cubre incluso a los hermanos y hermanas centroamericanas que están allí con nosotros, más de un millón. Eso es la palabra universal. That's a universal word. Eh, educación pública. Public education. Y otros eh, beneficios para toda la población. And other benefits for the public. En el largo camino del 48 a hoy, In the long journey from 1948 to today, hemos perdido de vista algo que queríamos construir juntos y juntas. We've lost sight of what we wanted to build together. Tenemos privatización en todos los sentidos. We have privatization in all aspects. Eh, tenemos uh, ¿cuántas universidades privadas de garaje? Privadas. Sí. How many private universities? Sí, escuelas, colegios y universidades privadas. Schools, universities. Y tenemos más de 60 mil, podría estimarse. We have uh, approximately 60,000 policías privados. Private police. Porque con esa percepción de inseguridad. Because of the um, perception of insecurity que tiene el pueblo that the public has uh, paga los servicios privados de seguridad they support the private services uh, alhambra con, llena de alambre su casa full of um, the wire the barbed wire um, cierra puertas y ventanas Closed windows and closed doors. Y nos hemos convertido and we've become en personas solitarias y egoístas. Um, solitary people. Isolated. Isolated. Y prontas a perder eh, todos los beneficios que hemos logrado a través de los años. And so we're losing all those benefits that we've created over the years. Por eso el Estado, las instituciones del Estado, um, for that reason the state institutions, están preocupadas por eh, eh, los niveles de violencia, are uh, concerned about the levels of violence. Y cada una está haciendo eh, acciones and Each one is uh, taking action para la prevención de la violencia. To prevent violence. Para la promoción de una cultura de paz. To promote a culture of peace. Para la atención de las víctimas. For the benefit of the victim. Porque promoción y prevención es una tarea que nos toca a todos y todas. Because the promotion and prevention is um, a job we all need to partake in. Por eso, that is why, desde mi oficina, que se llama, from my office, which is called, Dirección General para la Promoción de la Paz, the general, the general director direct, or director for the promotion, the promotion of peace, of peace. Eh, estamos tratando, We're trying de llamar la atención a las personas to call to the para que 
construyamos cada una so that each of us, uh, build en nuestro interior la paz um, in our internal self, the peace. y así poder en conjunto so that way to, together, construir la paz social. Create social peace. social gains which we gained uh, with the revolution in 1948 with the abolition of the army. Es el uso de los recursos naturales. It's the use of natural resources. Tenemos un instituto que maneja el agua. We have an institute which manages water provision. Con el objetivo de servir de agua a la población. With the objective of serving the entire population. No para hacer dinero. Not to make money. Tenemos una cobertura de más del 92% de la telecomunicación. We cover with 92% para comunicar, no para hacer plata. With, to communicate, not to make money. Y esos son dos puntos muy importantes también por los cuales estamos tratando de defender de, de los rivales del tratado. And those are two points which we are strongly trying to uh, oppose the treaty. Hasta ahora las, los uh, métodos son educativos o huelgas. Or, uh, up to this point, the methods that you've been using, have they been mostly educational or are you also looking to do protesting, strikes and things like that? Muy buenas protestas. <laughs> <laughs> Very good protests. Eh, reuniones en las comunidades, todas las comunidades con los indígenas, con los estudiantes, con los universitarios, con la, en las instituciones eh, and meetings in all communities with all different groups, uh, students, uh, indigenous people, uh, mothers, and also with institutions closely affiliated with the government. There's a strong campaign throughout the country to disseminate information to let people know what it is that we're trying to do. Still, television and radio are completely bought by people supporting that. And are people who are experts. Still, each one of us speak with the heart or from the heart to each community. So we are using both fronts, uh, information, education, and then also protests, although the um, coverage that is um, available in the media outlets is saying that, you know, four or five cats showed up to a, to a demonstration. So. You're so surprised. No. Entonces, por ejemplo, tenemos una de las compañeras que está con nosotros, María Suárez, que está en Radio Feminista, y hay otros medios de prensa alternativos por los cuales sí nos podemos we do have another colleague with us who is um, representative of uh, alternative media, which is helping us to seminar. They have a feminist radio. A feminist sí. radio. And the, <laughs> and the witch's <laughs> mail, which is the internet. Muy buena información porque hay redes muy fuertes. Y cuando hay una convocatoria, todos estamos ahí. Todos estamos ahí. And it's a strong network because when there is a call to action, everyone is there. Al principio, mucha confianza voy con mis hijos con mis nietos vamos después un poco asustada at first with much confidence I would go with my daughter sons with my uh, grand grandchildren but then with a little more fear porque presentimos en algún momento que hay una fuerza de represión because we felt that there was a force of repression este, eh, y alguna posibilidad de, de, de disturbio no por nosotros and some possibility of a disturbance or okay. violence, not from our part. Que no we hope that's not the case. Nosotros en Costa Rica tenemos muy marcadas dos situaciones. Digamos, nuestro presidente Oscar Arias 
maravilloso hacia la comunidad internacional. In this, in our country, we have two marked situations, which is our our president, a wonderful individual in the face of the international public. Muy cuestionado internamente. But very much questioned internally. ¿Cómo podemos nos ayudarlas? How can we help? Being part of the witches' mail, the internet. Even if you're a man, I love men. Website, un sitio de web o un correo electrónico. En mi país son de este tamaño. Si 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 Eso es en inglés. Y eh, del Congreso en español, lo mismo que usted tú, abolición.